Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Winecast. I'm back after a minor hiatus and thought I would just dip my toe back in the wine vat and hit the ground running with a brief but hopefully practical cast on making sense out of something many wine drinkers see every time they buy wine, the humble but influential shelf talker. Shelf talker is an industry term for a tag attached to a shelf or bin holding wine or any other product, really, that provides you with extra information about the wine in order to entice you to buy it. The tags can come from the importer distributor that the retail outlet bought the wine from, in which case they're technically known as vendor tags or vendor talkers, or they can be written by someone on premises at the store where you're buying the wine. Some stores use both, and of course, some use none. There's definitely a correlation between the size of the wine shop and the use of shelf talkers with stores or chains that sell in large volume and have a low ratio of salespersons to customers tending to use them more aggressively as their use makes it easier for customers to get an idea of what they want to buy if they don't already know without having to hunt down an employee as well as making it easier for employees to recommend a wine if they haven't had an opportunity to try it themselves. I know some wine drinkers who swear they never read them, but I do, my theory being that a little more information never hurt anyone when it comes to choosing wines, and sometimes they're your only source of information about the wine you might be buying. I'm a definite believer that the best way to buy your wine is from a source that you trust, that has both an extensive amount of wine knowledge and an intimate relationship with their inventory, ideally having sampled everything that they sell in the shop. In practice, this usually means an independent wine retailer of moderate to small size, staffed by individuals who are in the know wine-wise. But buying wine this way isn't always an option, either for logistical, economic, or other reasons. And if you find yourself without wine-savvy support when contemplating a purchase and just don't have the time, means, or inclination to do an online search for the wines you're looking to buy, a good shelf talker can steer you toward the best purchase. But reading these things is a little bit of an art unto itself. And here's the best advice I've got to offer when facing the big wall of wine with the little yellow tags. The key information that most wine drinkers tend to be looking for when choosing a wine usually boils down to a few points. Most wine drinkers, whether they're new to wine or not, want to know what flavors they'll find in the bottle, how dry the wine is, what other sensory components like alcohol, fruit, acid, oak, and tannin they're likely to encounter, and whether or not these components are in balance with each other in the wine. A good shelf talker will give you information on all or most of these, but remember that a shelf talker isn't a wine review. Reviews, in addition to being longer, are meant to give you a full exposition of what's going on in a wine, positive and negative. But a shelf talker is designed to sell bottles, so you'll have to tease out information from them by reading carefully. Some examples should help with doing this. Most shelf talkers will usually say something about what the wine they're promoting tastes like, but things can get a little dicey depending on how much detail the copywriter does or doesn't provide. The key here i found is to look for a moderate amount of detail describing flavors and aroma. Why moderate? Well, if there's very little detail at all, maybe just some general statement that the wine is fruity or earthy or something like that, that would suggest to me that whoever wrote the copy doesn't have a lot of experience with wine evaluation and is just reaching for some broad descriptors to fill out the note. It's not a crime to have limited evaluation experience. We all started somewhere after all. But when it comes to choosing between wines, I'd like enough specifics to make a good decision. So a note like this one that mentions nothing more specific than berries and citrus and then moves on to give a pretty generic endorsement of rosé as a good food wine doesn't do a lot to help me get a sense of what's in the bottle. Nor am I won over by this note that doesn't say much more than that I should expect citrus and minerals in my soft lunk. I want to recognize that as long as they're accurate about the varietal, very basic descriptions like this can be helpful if a grape varietal is new to you. After all, Sauve Blanc tends to be minerally and citrusy, and it does go well with goat cheese. But they aren't as helpful as they could be. At worst, though, you get something like this, which is a great example of how to use a thesaurus, but really tells you nothing about the wine. And when I read a talker like this, I always get the nagging feeling that whoever wrote the copy didn't actually taste the wine. And yes, that's totally a thing that happens in the industry. It may seem obvious why too little description wouldn't be a plus, but why would too much description be bad? Overly descriptive tasting notes, whether on a shelf talker or in a wine review or on the back copy of a wine label, present a different set of problems. The issue deserves and will eventually get its own cast, but the main problem is that the wine lovers and critics often like to think that they're objectively reporting flavors in the glass, 
What research there is on taste and smell perception in wine shows that there is a large subjective element in the tasting experience. This isn't to suggest that evaluating a wine is purely subjective. It's not. Just that tasters bring a lot more of their personal associations to the experience than most of them think they do. And they often end up riffing imaginatively on a wine because something in the bottle triggers an association that wouldn't be there for you or me or anyone else but that taster. In other words, if a note just says the wine is fruity, meh, it's not much help. If it says there are a lot of red berry flavors in the wine and adds a few more specific descriptors, now that's something I can use. But if it swears that I'm going to get rainier cherries, not Bing, but rainier, I'm likely in for a bit of a disappointment. But I'll be happy for the fellow who wrote the tasting note since he probably had a nice memory of that one summer he spent eating ripe cherries in Seattle with his grandmother. And speaking of grandma, if the note says that I'm going to smell the inside of my grandmother's leather purse, I read that once, true story and no joke, I don't know what to tell you because my grandmother, well, didn't have a leather purse. Sweet wines, including wines that are just lightly sweet, can be great, but if I'm buying a sweet wine, I want to know that that's what I'm getting. This is especially true for the growing market in sweet reds that you see on more and more American store shelves. Residual sugar won't usually appear on a wine label, and terms like off-dry won't consistently appear either, especially on reds, so the shelf talker can be your ally here. Look for a flat-out admission that the wine is sweet or lightly sweet or maybe just has a, quote, hint of sweetness. And failing that, look for terms that emphasize fruit. Terms like luscious and ripe are good indicators, as is the generic term fruity. Consider these two labels, each from a red blend, one from California and one from Washington. The talker for the California blend on the left does a good job of giving you specifics about the wine, and I'm pretty sure that whoever wrote it either tasted the wine or wrote it based on the notes of someone who had. I feel the same way about the Washington blend, but note the difference in the descriptors between the two. The California talker uses descriptors that you'd be just as likely to find in a recipe for a fruit tart, while the Washington talker introduces more savory and floral components to the description. If I had to guess, I'd say the California wine is carrying some noticeable sweetness, while I wouldn't draw the same conclusion about the Washington wine. It's important to be cognizant of the varietal that you're dealing with, too, when making assessments about sweetness from wine talkers. The fruit on completely dry Zinfandels, for example, can be described as big, luscious, and ripe, without any indication that you're going to get an off-dry or sweet wine, though a term like fruity would still make me suspicious. But those same descriptors on an inexpensive red blend are a good indication that there's going to be some sugar. In some varietals, like Riesling, or some styles like Rosé, sweetness has become a virtual default, and you'll want to pay attention to language that identifies the wine as dry, either by just saying so, or by emphasizing mineral and vegetal notes over fruit. And, since a little sweetness helps wine cope with a spicy dish, identifying a white or rosé as a good wine to pair with spicy food has become a sort of code for indicating that the wine is at least off-dry. The question of balance among the different sensory components is the trickiest one to suss out from a shelf talker. If a wine is out of balance, that is, if one of its major components dominates the profile at the expense of the others, that's a bad thing and shelf talkers aren't in the business of pointing out a wine's problems. So here you'll want to read the note closely to see if a theme emerges about the wine's sensory properties. So, if a note can't shut up about the fruit, that may be all you're going to find in the glass. By way of a negative example, if the talker is trying to promote an acidic varietal like Riesling or Sangiovese, but doesn't mention its crispness or its ability to make the mouth water, that should at least raise an eyebrow. If a wine is hot, or out of balance in terms of alcohol, that's not likely to appear on a shelf talker, but occasionally a note will call attention to the excellent alcohol balance on a wine that usually has a very al high alcohol by volume, like a Zinfandel or a Napa Cab. If you do see a comment like that on a shelf talker, that's pretty professional and suggests that the writer has some familiarity with wine evaluation. The same is true for any mention of tannin which is a term that a lot of wine drinkers aren't familiar with, and bringing it up in a shelf talker suggests that the note is aimed at drinkers with some wine knowledge and was probably written by someone or under the direction of someone with some wine experience. And speaking of tannins, a wine's oak treatment and the length thereof, if there was one, may need to be inferred from clues on the talker. 
In reds, look for mention of vanilla and wood, like cedar. And references to caramel and brown sugar suggest that the oak treatment was aggressive and that the oak was toasted. In whites, look for similar descriptors as well as those that emphasize creaminess, which, along with references to butter, suggest a fair amount of malolactic fermentation. Whites that have descriptors like this would benefit from some acidity to counterbalance the heaviness of the oak, so look for descriptors that would suggest good acid as well. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. I hope this cast was helpful and interesting, and if it was, please like or subscribe if you haven't already, and always feel free to leave a comment. I'm looking forward to tackling the various suggestions for casts that have been left by viewers, so if you made one of them, look for them to start showing up in the hopefully near future. Thanks as always to all my subscribers, commenters, and to anyone who's taken the time to stop in for a view. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.